So welcome everyone. It's lovely to see so many of you here today on a day that uh, has all of us thoroughly distracted by the clown show that is happening south of this border anyway. Um, I, uh, I'm really grateful that uh, all of you have come because I know that this uh, book we're going to discuss today is uh, absolutely uh, brilliant and worth all of our attention. So welcome to the Knowing Africa seminar series where uh, uh, we've had a few this uh, term uh, from uh, um, beginning with uh, Sabelo and Glovo Gacheni on decolonization uh, and working through the term through a range of issues in which really what we are trying to do in this program is to uh, open up a discussion uh, that shows off, uh, if, I, if I can put it that way, uh, Kamari, the very best of thinking on and from Africa uh, as a way to uh, make, I think, this intervention from the Institute of African Studies that Africa is not only a place that people should go out and treat as their case study field material, but also as a place that is fully engaged in processes of theory making. Um, and we couldn't have a better book uh, from which to uh, launch today's discussion of that uh, project. I want to um, also acknowledge those um, to, uh, to, to everyone that we are gathered uh, virtually, but many of us physically uh, in the space uh, that is unceded territory uh, of the Algonquin people, that, these, uh, that, that that recognition is a way of saying we have many unresolved issues of justice before us, uh, not just in Africa, but here in Canada as well, and to bear that in mind as we, we debate. Um, a welcome particularly to Kamari, Clark, who uh, I'm delighted has uh, agreed to, to talk about her book. Uh, I'm, everybody uh, has heard me, who knows me, has heard me say that one of my big disappointments when I arrived at Carlton um, was learning that Kamari, who was such an attraction um, in the Carlton community, was in fact uh, heading off to Toronto. Um, Kamari Clark is uh, trained as an anthropologist at the New School, uh, as was uh, Christiane uh, and Yale. Uh, she was, she is now, as I say, at the University of Toronto in two spaces, Kamari, uh, spreading yourself thin, thin, the Centre for Criminology and Sociolegal Studies and the Centre for the Diaspora and Transnational Studies. Um, her work uh, at Yale, uh, I think many people will know she was the chairperson of the Council on African Studies at Yale um, and is a leading anthropologist of the law um, and of legal regimes. Um, this is her second book, in fact, on the ICC, uh, the International Criminal Court. Um, this one specifically um, expanding her argument that we have to understand the criminal court not uh, as simply as a kind of um, rational, uh, objective, disembodied structure of decision making, uh, but to have to think about the antecedents uh, to justice that come into the processes of legal thinking, legal reasoning and adjudication, as well as the reception of those uh, legal frameworks and regimes by the people who are uh, affected by them. Uh, Christian Wilke, Associate Professor in Law and Legal Studies here at Carlton, uh, is going to launch us into the discussion um, of, of the book and uh, take us uh, into a little more focused discussion of a set of questions. Christian um, studies the ways in which large-scale violence is thought about uh, in international law, how it is it's made visible by people, uh, things like genocide, bombings, uh, the disappearances of 
not just of people, but also the places that people occupied, right? How these get uh, um, made visible by the people affected by them. So I can't think of a better interlocutor for the book uh, than Christiane, both these scholars thinking about law in these highly critical terms and looking, thinking about the law, um, not in technical terms, but uh, at the, at, in foundational ways. So the way we're going to go about it uh, is that uh, Kamari is going to um, talk about uh, why she wrote the book, I guess, and what her main contributions are in the book um, before we move to Christiane. Uh, welcome, Kamari, and I'm going to hand it over to you. Okay, uh, thank you, Shireen, and uh, of course, thank you to, to Femi as well and the Center for African Studies for the invitation to present uh, or discuss my book. Uh, I, I guess I'm so used to saying book in progress, but, but really it's out in the world now, and uh, so I'm looking forward to the discussion. Um, but just two things before I get started. One, of course, we're in the midst of the uh, results of the American elections. And just as we were starting, I said to Shireen that had I known it was the day after the elections, um, I might have pushed for a different date. But, um, you know, who was to know that things would drag on like this in this way when I accepted this commitment? Um, and of course, in my case, I had been living in the States for over 30 years. So, um, uh, the, the, the implications and the the real life implications, of course, of the U elec U.S. elections uh, continue to, to haunt me and will have uh, effects that will reverberate for so many of us, whether we're there or here. Um, I, so, so much of my talk today, or the, the excerpt that I'll um, share with you, is about the International Criminal Court, the emergence of that court in relation to its, its insertion in African circuit. Uh, but it's not, this, this process is, is not unlike so many things that we're seeing in the world around uh, these international institutions and around the pushback, not just Pan-Africanist pushback, but of late uh, a, mo a most vehement pushback by the U.S. around the Afghanistan investigation. Um, it, some of the themes that we're seeing in our contemporary world that, that have to do with, for example, in the U.S. context, make America great again, uh, the, the kind of referentiality to George Wallace and to white supremacy and white privilege are very much part of the same um, architecture around African leaders, around uh, human rights activists that, that many, many people use to deploy to deploy figures uh, that are at the heart of their, their sentiment. And in doing that, they needn't say anything about the figures, but simply engage in a, a, a set of, a practice of referentiality where they're referring and indexing certain things and don't need to spell out what those things are, but we all know what they are. Um, and so this, this process of thinking about the way it's playing out in these African context in which all of the cases before the International Criminal Court are African cases. Uh, and in many ways, the joke is that the ICC, the International Criminal Court, uh, is as an appetite for Africa, um, which is often said jokingly, uh, but which has a much larger context that so much of the book uh, tries to address by uh, formulating a, a a conceptual framework through which to think about some of these questions. And then finally, before I start, I should say that, um, yes, Shireen, I, I agree that when I knew that you were joining Carlton, of course, that was the basis for some of my sadness. And at least we had many, a couple of lunches and coffees together before, before my departure. But, but I'm glad you're there, and I'm glad that our students and colleagues have you. Um, there as as a leader and a, as a and as an important interlocutor and i hope that we can continue these conversations uh so thank you and thank you to christiane of course who has agreed to to engage with 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 me today um it's 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 i'm i'm actually quite thrilled to be 
in this conversation with my colleagues as well, because so much of the book uh, came of age when I was at Carleton from um, 2015 to, to 2018. Um, the Department of Law and Legal Studies, Vegans, uh, the African Studies program, of course, and, and Anthropology were really my colleagues there and students and a couple of my RAs uh, who were involved uh, at different times were, were part of helping it bring it, it into fruition. The, the uh, book workshop that we had there um, through Begins and Law and Legal Studies was critical. So it's really fitting to, to be engaging today. So, um, but so on that note, thank you to, to all of you and thanks Shireen and Femi for the invitation. So Affective Justice then uh, is of course, a, a book that attempts to introduce international justice in African context through a theoretical vocabulary for making sense of international institutions in Africa. And one of the, the key questions that the, the book uh, tries to ask in a, much broader, in a much broader sense is how do justice institutions like the International Criminal Court, like its assemblage of actors, its political economies, the imaginaries that are part of an institution like the International Criminal Court, how does it operate with effectiveness and with force when in fact it doesn't have universal jurisdiction, it doesn't have uh, the enforcement power of a state, it doesn't have a police force or a military, or even uh, an assumed citizenry uh, to which people uh, vow their allegiance. Um, it has none of those things in the way that a state might enjoy those mechanisms and by extension deploy its legal power um, with the security of those things. And so this is a larger question that's often asked and the, the answer of course um, presumes a, a whole set of other things. The, the legal answer is often it refers back to its technocratic power, that it is law and international law is law. And, and what I tried to do with this book is to, to, to actually answer it in a different way, to demonstrate um, how it works, how international law works, why it works the way that it, do, it does, how do Africans feel about its machinations, and how can we understand its power both within and outside of African countries. And one of the things that, that emerges from the book is, that, and, is um, a finding that, in fact, there are three three core components that are part of the, the working power of, of, this, of an institution like an international criminal court. Uh, but there are many other international institutions to which we could subject this type of questioning, you know, from what does it gain its power that goes well beyond its technocratic legal power or the power of a treaty or a statute. In the case of international criminal, the International Criminal Court, it's the figure of the victim the figure of the perpetrator and the, the, the idea of and the figure of the international community. The idea is that there is a we, the people, who are part of this international community that, that I argue in the book are central to the affective imaginary that is actually at work in these international justice contexts. And so the, the book then shows that it, it so it's not the formalized lawmaking mechanisms in, in fact that if we reverse it and think about the, the, the basis on which buy-in and meanings and, and justice making take shape, we'll see that it gains its power through this ephemeral, the ephemeral imaginaries, these embodied moral responses to perceptions of in, injustice that often exist through and within particular conditions of power, including legal, legal power. And so, um, indeed, justice then is, we can see justice as shaped by legal power that plays an important role in expanding and displacing uh, and uh, ending injustice. But part of what the, I'm working through in, in the text is to demonstrate that in these circuits, it doesn't start and end there, that um, the practices that produce justice making are often invisible and be, and often don't become evident until long after these text tensions are documented. And, and so part of the, 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 the work here is to demonstrate how that happens in real time 
in, in terms of the literature that I'm engaging, um, certainly the sociocultural literature on affect and emotion, uh, as well as um, political, legal, socio-legal work, uh, work in African studies around violence in, and uh, post-election violence in African contexts, and and in part um, the much of the the point of departure uh, is is one in which I'm trying to demonstrate that we think about the ways that people make and remake their social worlds and that we not only think about these affective formations in these micro um, um, configurations, but also in their macro and meta formulations and think about the tension and interrelationship between the, the politics of inner subjectivity, the, the ways it plays out in these um, micro formulations that are fundamentally interconnected and, and deeply historical, and what it means to think in meta terms about and to theorize um, these processes in these larger global circuits and assemblages that to, to understand our anger about or our feeling when we recognize, you know, in uh, 2005 that actually the ICC was a court that was going to proceed and indict all African cases. The, the kind of ambivalence that many of us felt as we watched in the courtrooms and documented and talked with uh, uh, people about it is not unrelated to the, the history of the IMF and loan conditions and structural un, in, um, adjustment and the um, 100 years of the long durée of um, displacement of, of Africans in particular regions. If we think about post-election violence in Kenya, we might very well try to put together the dots to, to make sense of the displacement of people and contemporary, the displacement of people from the 1800s into the 1900s and contemporary post-election violence. And so the, the connections are deeply historical, they're structural, they are embedded and embodied and interrelated. And so the, the, the challenge here is to think about the, the, the modalities through the, which this uh, takes place to connect the, these micro processes with macro and meta. And so what I wanted to do was to read an excerpt from the preface of the book, a very short excerpt to give you a sense of the book's arc and, um, and then to say a few things about the conceptual framework that, that uh, frames that arc. Uh, and then I, I figure I'd stop there. And I know Christiane has, has some comments and, um, as well. And then I can take questions. So I'll start with uh, reading an excerpt from the, the premise. On the plane en route to Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, to attend my first African Union summit in 2012, I sat next to an American missionary about to launch a new church in neighboring Kenya. Though excited about the newness of his contract, he was wary of the difficulties Americans encounter living in African cities. He was concerned that the, his way of life was different and that he would have to shift his standards and become at one with his parishioners. Though he never used the language that was explicitly shocking and derogatory, it was clear that he saw his role as bringing a much needed form of humanitarian enlightenment to Africa. This was made palatable through the way he spoke of the disavowed dimensions of violence and poverty. And then came the discussion of my work. After the usual niceties, he launched with a pointed interrogative, has the, Af quote, has the International Criminal Court convicted Kenyatta and al-Bashir yet, end quote. I paused. It was out of shock from this presumption that I, another North American, was like him in ideological conformity with his worldview. And though the charges for President Kenyatta and Deputy President Ruto had since been uh, suspended by the ICC prosecutor's office. At the time, I responded, responded with resignation about not knowing how things would play out. And also with resignation, I offered, and, al and also with resignation, I offered a familiar American trope that, quote, they were guilty until proven innocent, end quote. To that, he insisted that I would need to 
if I wanted to talk about innocence, I should focus on the innocent victims who needed justice, end quote. Here, the presumption that the deceased and the survivors were innocent and the African elite needed to be stopped, that blood was on their hands and the well and wealth in their pockets was at large. And for him, convicting the sitting presidents of Kenya and Sudan would secure justice for the survivors of Africa. I could not resist but turn to the similarly troubling issues at home. At the time, America's wars in Iraq, Afghanistan, that led to the death of thousands of innocent civilians, but to my interlocutor, America's war on terror was a just war, unlike what he saw in, as the irrational violence in, Af in Kenya and Sudan. He spoke with a passion and his assumptions about justice presumed that these two trials were key to ending impunity in Africa. As this soon-to-be resident of Kenya spoke, I couldn't help but think about the kind of life that he was preparing for himself and how important the discourse of justice abroad was for him in explaining America's place, his place, in improving the world's future. I also thought about what the latent sense of feel-good humanitarian discourses did that were, that were popular amongst many North American missionaries, NGO workers, journalists that I met during that time in, in East Africa. And of course, while on the plane that day, I began to think about the words that my intimate stranger used, the images, the feelings associated with the words, and the way that they danced in our imaginations and became entangled by other histories and consolidated our different feelings of justice. His notion of justice, understood as the legal protection of those victimized by violence, was clear, but it was not necessary to extrapolate further, at least not beyond what he had, al had already. He and I knew what he meant, and yet so much was partial and not unnecessary to spell out. The rest was expressed through sentimental expressions, tone of, tone of voice, word e emphasis, facial expressions, hand motions, bodily responses. These nonverbal cues reflected the type of affective bodily responses that accompanied the aspirational dreams of justice writ large, and through their passionate utterances, they constituted our alliances. What was not evident was how the feelings of what justice is were produced through particular educational knowledge domains and perpetrated through various emotional regimes that contribute to how feelings are embodied as legitimate. A similar set of justice convictions also propelled through emotional discourses were predominant during my field work in, in Nigeria, certainly in Ethiopia and Addis, and in Kenya between 2013 and 2017, and highlighted the ways that alliances were formed through sentimentally uttered discourses. So while carrying out this research, I traveled from place to place and with my research team in different contexts, soliciting reactions, to the ICC's indictments of African leaders while also following ICC cases, collaborating with thought leaders, online platforms. And one of the things that, that what was clear was a, another set of discourses that emerged uh, over time. Um, and I'm fast forwarding now in the preface uh, to just a, a final section where um, I say, while many felt that various leaders of African states were corrupt and uncommitted to the lives of the ordinary person, some still defended them because of their recognitions of uh, the recognition of Europe's history of extraction and underdevelopment of Africa and the way that those histories are part of the contemporary plunder of the regions. Other def others defended their leaders, insisting that the problems were structural. Uh, that although independence produced political freedom, it did not free African states of, from entrenched political, economic, moral, religious formations that were also part of the plunder of Africa's resources. And amongst those who refused to defend African leaders for their failures, they often turned to international bodies such as NGOs or legal instruments. And one particular um, uh, moment, uh, occurred at, a, at an NGO meeting in which an Ethiopian colleague in response to a presentation at a meeting that sought to uh, 
depict the ICC as a political force characterized through a long history of European colonial instrumentalization, he immediately r rose up. This is the um, Ethiopian um, NGO worker, and he rose up and in the audience and declared without hesitation uh, and profundity, I am a proud African, and I quote, yet I have lived personally under a repressive regime, experienced the abuse of power, and I have survived it. Then he continued, quote, this debate about the value of the ICC has been poisoned by our leaders. We should not replicate this mis misrepresentation at this forum. We must speak to each other through the, the letter of the law. We must stop posturing and debate frankly, end quote. And so here, what we see is that this particular colleague claims an eyewitness insider standpoint. He's impassioned, he's compelling, he speaks with conviction, his vo voice trembles with frustration and anger. His statement reflects the conviction of someone who reveled what the country has offered the contemporary world, but bitterness about its human rights failures. He was himself a member of an ethnic majority and enjoyed the benefits of that class, but he worked tirelessly to ensure that those that he saw as less fortunate would have a fighting chance. And so what's key here in, in this excerpt is the discourse around saving African victims and the fact that he was himself a victim as well. So invoking the language of, of, of the victim and saving victims. And his, I, I only read an excerpt of, of what he had to say, but it continued and the, the invocation of, of victimhood and African victimhood is profoundly effective and, and important because it's felt it reflects his experience of pain and harm and hurt and disappointment, uh, but it, it also does a different kind of work. And um, these two, two scenarios then point to, um, and with their three components, the missionary, the, the, the person defending or, or recognizing structural inequality, as well as um, the, the, the African NGO worker in uh, Addis who is objecting and claiming the victim status and that the law can be mobilized to protect victims. Um, it's part of a broader debate about international criminal justice, who has the power to name it, to deliver it, what it does, and what is at its center. And this is what I refer to as affective justice. And so affective justice then in the book is a term that I advance for understanding people's embodied engagements with and production of justice through particular structures of power, history, and contingency. And, and central to the affective justice are um, because it operates within an assemblage that is messy and and complex and not part of a linear linear progression at all uh, and within this assemblage of messiness are three component parts that um, boring on Deleuze and Guattari's work I I frame in relation to three things embodied affect and these are the the embodied um, at, at times pre-social, biosocial uh, responses that are with, within us, uh, that are part of, and that aren't always knowable, uh, that are part of the, this justice uh, domain. They're also, the second is emotional regimes. These are the tropes, the symbols, the images. So invoking Jomo Kenyatta as freedom fighter uh, and having uh, Uhuru Kenyatta invoking Jomo Kenyatta, uh, you know, some 50 years later and using the imagery of a different moment, a revolutionary moment of, po of colonial resistance in a contemporary moment of elitism um, and a response to judicial, uh, judicial arrest by, or the possibility of judicial arrest by um, the International Criminal Court. Uh, it's, it's Part of the what we see are these regimes that get invoked, that that embed themselves, uh, or that people use to embed in in history and in figures, and they they do a particular kind of work in the same way that Sarah Ahmed, in her work, talks about what emotions do. Um, and here, through emotional regimes, I'm interested in what people do with emotions, uh, and what people do with these figures, these symbols. And of course, in our backyard, the American elections make America great again, 
What is that emotional regime? What is the trope? What is the symbol? What does it do without naming everything that's part of its imagery? And the third are the techn technocratic forms of knowledge. So these are the these forms of biopolitical governance, the um, modes and politics of life and death. Uh, they're, they're certainly about these structuring devices, governance. They're also about legality. Uh, they're about the, the mobilization of science um, that, that certainly are part of the, the, what or how law can produce particular ends. And so with, with those three organizing components, those component parts, then effective justice then attempts to show that, that it, it, the making of international justice and its circulation in these African sites, so in Kenya, in Cote d'Ivoire, where there was an indictment, in, in, in terms of the arrest warrant for al-Bashir in uh, Sudan at, at the time, um, and you know we can go on and on with the indictments, Dominic Anguin, et cetera, uh, that, that these that, that these processes of indictments and uh, justice making aren't simply discursive uh, and that discursive processes that allow us to adjudicate mass atrocity violence and international justice doesn't simply work through the uh, objective of the technocratic application of law, black letter law, um, that, that in fact, International justice is propelled through sociopolitical, juridical, technocratic modes of production that are fundamentally affected. That that how we vote, why we vote, how um, effective justice can organize the the conditions of possibility, is 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 deeply uh, in in French, but it's it's often dismissed as uh, not relevant, insignificant. Um, not part of the calculus through which we think about the, the making of these processes. Uh, and so through Effective Justice then, through the, the book, I examined the ways that these affects, affects constitute publics, um, and they do that um, in these transnational terms as the ICC moves from place to place with indictment as African, uh, those who have been victimized, who are survivors of violence, those who are responding to the ICC's work, um, respond to these, these, these challenges. And by demonstrating the effective domains of justice making, it tells us something about the way that feeling regimes are actually fueled and the, the work that they do. And through their work, we can understand um, results that are often contradictory, that don't quite seem to make sense. Uh, and so that's in a, in a nutshell that, you know, there are a number of other core concepts in, in the book, legal encapsulation, um, reattribution, um, you know, a number of other organizing concepts that are part of a, a critical part of explaining the, the contemporary period where we ask for justice and we get law. Um, this is a, a, a phrase that is a popular response that is used by various progressive NGO workers uh, after dealing with violent situations with states in Latin America, in, in, um, in parts of Africa. We ask for justice, you give us law. Uh, this is the, the move towards the juridic, juridified solution to justice, to inequality, to injustice is part of our contemporary moment. The 21st century the, the, you know, the turn to legality for every political decision when in fact um, the, 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 the nature of so much of that violence is, is deeply political, it's historical, it's entrenched and embedded in long histories of injustice. And so the turn to law um, has a place at times, but the, the, our contemporary moment is a moment in which um, the law is encapsulating the basis for justice. Um, and, and much of the research that the, the book discusses is about the problematic around legal encapsulation, where through the encapsulation of the concept of justice, we get the victim as part of the encapsulation of justice. So you have justice, law, and victim. And, and then we wonder why it is that we have a given result after 
uh, a, you know, a legal herring, a police shooting, etc. cetera, um, uh, because in fact, that has to be disaggregated. And so much of the book is really about conceptually disaggregating and, and reframing the ways through which we understand uh, justice making in real time. Uh, so on that point, um, I'll, I'll stop there with that introduction and, and welcome Christian's uh, comments and, and certainly questions that will follow. Thank you. Marvelous, marvelous. Thank you. Christian, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, it's, it's an honor to be invited to, um, to respond to, I guess, both the presentation and the book. Um, Kamari has been an amazing colleague while she was at Carlton. She always made a point of stopping by after her grad seminar. And I really remember those chats and they were really a highlight of my week. So it's, it's, it's great to be able to see you again, although you're just in a small Zoom window for now, but um, it's a pandemic. It's a combination of circumstances. Um, the book is, is incredibly rich and you should all read it, obviously, if you have not already. Um, it is, um, you know, it, it starts from things that we should all interrogate more, like the, the idea that injustice, stings, hurts, is connected to feelings, I think is a lot more clear than the, than, than the way that justice is also connected to affective states to emotional regimes. And I think the book is great at drawing out how certain imaginaries of justice are interlaced with, um, with emotional regimes that then propel the political force to give legs to an ICC that doesn't really have its own police force and its own people. Um, the book is really generative for theorizing justice, for theorizing international criminal justice, um, affects, and community in different contexts. Um, and I'd like to start by actually, you know, drawing in the, the quote uh, from, from Berbe Bola originally that Kamari ended with, um, we wanted justice and um, I'm like, I think my original German translation would be, we wanted justice, but all we got was a rule of law. So it's interesting in how that quote traveled, how its emotional affect was actually drained, because it was a quote about disappointment. It was like, we wanted justice and all we're getting is this like system of rules that does not at all respond to our perceptions of injustice. And in the 1990s, like every second, I swear every second um, article about transition justice in Germany written by a West German law professor would take this quote and then lecture her on why she should be happy about the rule of law. So um, this is one of the sites and other contexts in which you see how much uh, the rule of law that seems so technical and boring and devoid of emotion is, is deeply connected to um, a sense of self that is about uh, living with disappointments, that is about motivation, that's about patience, and those sort of the seeming, the seemingly emptying itself of emotions is itself a very emotional process of, uh, of convincing yourself that the thing you're seeing is actually, if not justice, at least it's good enough. Um, so of all the concepts in the book, that the, the one I'd like to focus on, um, kind of drawing out some some strands here is, is really reattribution. So um, that's that's a concept um, in which um, Kamari Clark describes the ways in which a disc or that's the, my description of what she does. Anyway, is is how a certain understanding of an offense and a perpetrator, like you know this this kind of capsule, a perpetrator victim offense, um, is reframed by um by doing different operations and i sort of found four different ones and um these retributions i find are interesting because some of them uh move away from a retributive, retributive um concept and some of them don't and i'd like to kind of maybe show some of those some of those tensions uh so one of one of the ways um that the book is you know great in pointing out is is that the ICC has a temporal jurisdiction that's very tight and very narrow, um, and it will not look at anything um, before 2002, uh, which is very convenient if you don't want to talk about colonialism, which they clearly don't. Um, so there's a way in which techni technocratic rules um, just happen to work very well in tandem with uh, historiographical preferences of, um, of those judges and, and judicial officials. Um, and the different ways of, in which colonial history is drawn in to paint a much richer picture of, of different um, perceived and felt um, injustice. And I'm not saying perceived and felt as in saying that they're not real, but it's more, um, I think there, there's some 
the complexity of, of those injustices and of who is, is supposed to be thought of as a perpetrator is genuinely complex. Um, the second form I would say on the basis of the book is to add different crimes to the rule book. So what the ICC ended up with was a focus on three crimes that are very much focused on violations of the physical human body. Uh, lots of African and also Caribbean states um, for decades have been asking to, you know, why are these and only these the top crimes? Why, you know, what about trafficking of drugs, of hazardous waste, um, of, of persons? Um, so so there's, there's often been longer lists of crimes that there's, that people wanted to be added to the list. Um, and this actually does not disturb the retributive logic, it just expands it to more crimes. And that, I think that's different than some of the other forms of challenging the, the basically the supremacy of the ICC logic about what's the big crimes. Um, a third one that is, um, is detailed in the book, and I think we can find this all over the place, is to, um, to insist on different perpetrators. And that's often done in conjunction with having a different uh, geographic and or temporal frame. Um, and um, depending on how the elections we're like all um, watching more or less are panning out, we might see a lot of discourse around those lines, right? So, um, and Kamari already talked about the YAS pushback against the International Criminal Court, which would be a subject, um, worthy subject of its own. Um, but again, I'm afraid for most people would write it, they would write it very differently from, from the way that book on the African pushback, and African pushback is written. So, but why? You know, like how do we, how do you bring those different forms of resistance to this to this core together? Um, and just one example in which the idea of different perpetrators um, can be used to also foster again, actually strengthen the retributive urge is um, a few years ago. I'm not sure exactly when, but um, Ivanka Trump sent this tweet that she was on uh, en route to The Hague, which to everybody, anybody working in international criminal justice is very funny because The Hague has come to stand in for the international criminal court. And of course, everybody was quoting the tweet and responding to it and saying, oh, I know a place for you to stay. Um, and it was fun. But, but so the way in which this playing with this clearly not very smart tweet um, that was not understanding the meaning of the symbolic meaning, <laughs> meaning that the place had come to stand from, um, I think shows how easily in popular culture, by just adding a different set of perpetrators, um, people make peace with those institutions. And, and the same in domestic criminal law in which criminal courts are bad, except for when certain soon to be ex-presidents are brought before them, right? Um, but as I know from a study of transitional justice in other contexts, I would say by, you know, by expanding the reach of criminal law to these cases that feel emotionally right, you're actually legit further legitimizing those courts. So that, I think that's like what I'm seeing as a third form, adding different perpetrators, in some way does not undermine the ICC, it actually strengthens and, and, and buttresses the logic. Um, and the fourth one um, that I'm sending through the book that, um, the author herself would be more uh, most most interested in, but that's sort of the least available because of the material is ima actually imagining imagining a different form of justice and a different form of justice. Um, and it's interesting that all that 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 seems to be the least direct. Um, and the the way in which international criminal law, as it has been formulated and it has been developed in um, hundreds and thousands of pages of decisions has become our dominant language for justice is really a tragedy in, in how it is how impoverished us for different ways of um, of judging violence with different ways of of, of understanding what violence is, is it even means uh, whether we take in use a concept of um, of slow violence um, or, or structural violence so, under, yeah, so understanding wrongs um, only through the lens of, of the ICC's vocabulary is clearly extremely limited. Um, but there are ways of sort of adding to the ICC vocabulary that strengthen its logic with that and do not actually disrupt it. And I think only the, um, only some of those responses um, are really um, you know, undermining um, the ICC's logic. Um, and another issue that's, um, that I think 
speaks to the ways um, in which race is baked into those concepts of international criminal law that, that are drawn out in the book is a question of responsibility. And it's not, it's not clear at all, um, but I think the ways of, of saying that since the Yamashita decision in 1946, where it was the Japanese general who was, who was convicted for actions of his subordinates that he objectively did not know about, um, like the responsibility of superiors from non-white and non-European contexts has been exaggerated beyond credible belief, to be, you know, to be frank about this. Um, and in more recent exercises of international criminal justice, it's, it's become clear that um, leaders are often imagined to have, to wield enormous power over their followers, which comes hand in hand with imagine their followers as not particularly um, I would almost say not particularly human as not having full agency and judgment. Now, as long as we're stuck within military institutions, um, we need to understand that obedience is part of that system and we cannot act as if it's not. But those ideas about basically command or superior responsibility have been very easily transferred to civilian contexts and especially in Africa. So why ordinary African citizens are, are judged the same way in terms of their alleged agency and judgment as, as a soldier who is literally under, under orders um, is something that I think very much in line with the book we cannot fully answer without taking questions about the imaginations of, of race into account. So in a way responsibility works here not just as a, as a description of facts, um, it, it interprets uh, facts on the ground, relationships between um, between different social groups, between authorities, um, but it also constructs them. It constructs certain actors as responsible, um, and certain actors as not as responsible. And this is this is one of the, of the tenets of of the the Kenya um, investigations that, um, as we see in the book, that many people were pushing back against. That they had a different understanding of who would actually be responsible. The ICC is mandated to investigate and prosecute those most responsible, but they've very consistently uh, understood this to mean those up in the chain of command. So that to me indicates that, that the um, responsibility is equated with, um, with being in positions of, of formal power and authority, which in cases like Kenya, um, I would have a few questions um, about. And um, just um, for wrapping up, one, one, one issue I do want to mention is that um, while the book very much focuses on cases of African ends of state being, um, being indicted, um, for, for very sound methodological reasons, um, looking at the cases, uh, it's also noteworthy that the ICC has a tendency what has to be described by other authors, so I'm, I'm wondering if that's a different interpretation, um, as being very happy to go after non-state military actors. So in the case of Uganda, for example, so there, there, there are multiple cases in which the ICC has only investigated one party to the conflict, um, and that's a non-state party. Um, so I'm not saying that the African states are the real winners of the ICC's politics, that's not the point, but, um, but there, are different, there, there are different ways in which certain forms of violence become visible to the ICC um, and, and others not. And personally, I argue that there, um, the same tendency that's happening with Afghanistan and other cases that have been hastily added um, because they're not in Africa and we want to show that um, we don't only do Africa. Um, but we'll see how this works out. Okay, um, those are my um, fairly confusedly written down comments and um, on a book that I find incredibly generating for, um, for this and other contexts. And um, that's, that's it for me for now. Thank Thanks, you. Krista. Kamari, you want to have a go at answering that before we open it up. And, and while you're doing that, um, I, I encourage people to raise their hand in the, uh, under the participants list and I will take questions once uh, Kamari's responded. Okay, uh, Shireen, how much time do we have? Do I take just five minutes to? Yeah, I think take five minutes and then maybe we can take 15 to 20 minutes of questions. Okay. Okay, great. Um, thank you, Christiana. Uh, 
this is great. And of course, I didn't take the time to explain reattribution uh, as a concept. And what, how I find reattribution useful. So for those who haven't read the book, um, part of the, the argument is, as I said earlier about legal encapsulation, we ask for justice, you give us law. Part of it is to think empirically of, about the judicialization of justice. And, and that reattribution is uh, the pushback. We, we see this in different ways. Now, there's, uh, there's a tension in the way that I use reattribution in this work. And I think Christiana did a really wonderful job of highlighting these three, these four trajectories that, that uh, find their way in different places throughout the text. Um, now, the, but, and, and she was nice, she, she didn't raise it as a critique or question, but in fact, the, I think the critique or the, the problematic, uh, to make it more blunt, uh, that, that I, I think she's highlighting is a critique that I've received from uh, a few other colleagues, which is, uh, and, and this has to do with Christiana's fourth point about new forms of justice. So you have a pushback or refusal where people are saying you can't, you can't ask the question who is culpable as of 2002 or as of 2009 and identify one or two or three high-ranking leaders, identify them as culpable without first thinking about the a priori conditions under which violence was meted in the first place, histories of displacement, et cetera, that these are all part of the, the, um, the contemporary conflict. So yes, that first point, the, the second point about subject matter jurisdiction, the addition of uh, crimes, toxic dumping, mercenaryism, um, and the list goes on and on that we see with uh, a move of Pan-Africanists who are pushing for the development of an African court. Um, and, and of course, the, the second, the, the third point that Christiania made as well as the fourth. Now, the, the fourth that could be interpreted as a critique is that, in fact, what we're seeing by this pushback by these elite actors, in many cases, not all of the actors in the text are elite. You know, some are everyday people that suffered as a result of violence like in Kenya and other places. Uh, and, but in part, what Christiania seems to be suggesting is that they're not necessarily asking for a different uh, imaginary or, uh, way of conceptualizing justice. In fact, they're using the law to mobilize, to either refuse the law or to, they're using the law to mobilize uh, the answer to the question, who else is culpable or what other crimes are culpable? And here, there's a difference that makes a difference here in, in what concerns me. And that is that it, it doesn't matter as, it matters that the, the African, the scholars, the Pan-Africanists, people at the African Union, etc., are saying, you know, these crimes are political crimes, genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, these are political crimes. Let's look at the underlying crimes the underlying acts that are actually enabling the secondary crimes, like drug trafficking, like mercenaryism, like exploitation, illicit exploitation of natural resources uh, in the Congo and elsewhere. Let's look at these underlying conditions and the, the, the corporate crimes, criminal corporate liability. That part of what they're saying is, let's look at these other actions that are actually enabling violence that, that, that the International Criminal Court is adjudicating. And what interests me about that is not so much the end result that it's through legality that that is producing a, a new form of justice and it's simply reproducing the same. It's true that that's doing that. But what, it, what interests me is the process of refusal. It is the indignation. It is the, it's how we, we, we link the point between a refusal to say, hey, the, the, the framing here is unacceptable. Hey, the, um, the, the, the conceptualization of culpability is wrong. The temporality of culpability is wrong. 
And, um, and I'm not as, I mean, I am interested in the final product, which is the creation of a new court, but I'm more interested in the, the act of refusal, what it does through emotion and how that invigorates a new logic, technocratic logic. And, you know, that's debatable, but because I, you know, there are many who would then have a counter argument to that, but, um, but I think that's important. Uh, okay. So I'll, I'll stop there because the, the point about non-state actors, the LRA and different sides of the conflict, it, it is an important political point about the court and the implications of a, an ICC or an indictment in, in a context in which it's not just one side. And it's, it's not that moment of adjudication, it's what happens after. Or if Ruto is recalled, what about Kenyatta's Posse, his follower, his his constituency, uh, that that there's an afterlife to uh, legality that that's relevant, and I think many would be interested in the the moral and ethical questions there around the work of the court and the afterlife of of such things. But I'll I'll, I'll stop there and welcome other questions. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Kamari. So could you raise your hand in the participants? Uh, list. I don't see uh, uh, Samuel. Go ahead, Samuel. Thank you very much. Um, congratulations on the book. Um, I'm happy you touch on the um, decolonization, the ongoing conversation around decolonization, and the the failure of institution of justice in Africa and the loss of faith of the common man and the, the appeal of the sentiment that the ICC can hold uh, African leaders to account. My question is, where does that lead us with the capacity for self-government in Africa? And how, what does that say about the African Union and the Court of Justice that is established and its in inability to hold African leaders accountable? We know about the, uh, the, the, the problem with the ICC, the illegitimacy of the ICC, how the US, for instance, said they are not going to allow ICC to investigate them. Yet, African citizens seem to think that ICC can be a, 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 a haven of justice for them. Uh, two weeks ago, over the past three weeks, the NSAS protests in Nigeria, people are appealing to the ICC to hold the Nigerian government accountable. Where does that leave Africa in the context of the decolonization discourse? Thank you. Thanks, Samuel. Kamari, you want to take that while others are... We have a number of legal scholars on the group, so I'm hoping for some questions from them too. Um, yeah. Yeah, um, thank you, Samuel. Uh, good to see you. Um, or I can't see you, but I see your name. And I hear, it's good to hear you, I should say, uh, under this uh, webinar format. Uh, yes, okay, thank you. <laughs> um, it, it, this is a, it's, a, it's a challenge. Um, this is a challenging question in, in many ways. Um, because on one hand, of course, in the Nigerian case and other, many other cases, uh, everyday people are wanting to hold leaders into account, leaders who uh, are culpable for many, many things, incitement, um, ignoring constituencies, um, uh, enabling ongoing poverty. But to, to think about, I, I think uh, there's on one level, there are African leaders, there is the problem with the contemporary post-colony around um, African leadership. On the other hand, uh, there's the, the role of international institutions, the IMF, the World Bank, etc., that is part of um, how and when um, uh, African states engage and, and support economies. And then on the other hand, there's the problem with uh, legal institutions and, you know, payouts and the, the reality that everyday people, ordinary people, don't trust governments to, to protect or to, to provide, and that instead 
uh, the idea of an ICC is a welcome idea because of the, the frustration around accountability for, for Africans. Um, the, 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 the issue though is that, and I think that there are, mul there are multiple things going on in that configuration, that the, this is about the play of power. It's about strategy. It's about uh, using whatever solutions are available because people need to eat. Uh, and that the very people who might be calling on the ICC to intervene for police brutality, for, you know, to pursue Boko Haram and, and crimes, uh, abductions, the missing, etc., cetera, to, to take seriously these, this sense of loss, uh, are also some of the same people who, in another breath, are critical of the ICC, who also may talk about the... The, the lack of coincidence that the ICC has an appetite or is, in, is pursuing African cases, but isn't necessarily serious about Israel and the, the case between Israel and Palestine or uh, pursuing Afghanistan seriously beyond simply an investigation. Um, there's a recognition that, that, that the ICC is operating in an unequal world where there are a lot of other variables and factors that are part of how it acts, when it acts, and when it cannot act, uh, when it's not able to, when it's not willing to, in fact. And so I, I think it's, and, and this is part of the complexity that I tried to highlight in the book, that, that on one hand, you might have someone who is pro-ICC. On the other hand, that same person who might in theory be pro-ICC will also be quite critical of a, an, an ICC project. Uh, in these macro terms. And, and I think that we have to put those things in, in tension. Uh, think about the individual at play, think about their engagement, the words they use, how they engage, how are they located um, in these meta formations as well. And, and not to shy away from them, but to think about their complexity and not to presume that individuals are singular objects that you're either pro or against because you're filing an election ballot for a party or against, but that individuals are complexly uh, engaged in strategies for justice as a result of injustice. So that's really the way that I've been conceptualizing that problematic, that it's contradictory, it's dialectical, uh, and that we have to look at them, these interrelationships at the same time. Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, I, it, uh, struck me when I was reading the book, how much of what you say about the ICC could be said about a structure like the Truth and Reconciliation Commission as well, that the way in which one's drawn to certain kinds of reasoning that suspend uh, context and, and, you know, that, that drama that was at the heart of even the TRC, that it was a vehicle that people did feel was something that they could use, but you know, it went along with simultaneously holding uh, alive the idea that it was at its root somewhat problematic, right? So, so that people do play uh, with both of those uh, in quite interesting ways. And the fact that they may use it doesn't necessarily imply that they buy into its fundamental logics. Although what I, what I I thought was really interesting in your in the latter part of your book was precisely um, the afterlives that we that we put in place that this, there's something accretes to these processes that that lives on in problematic ways um, and yeah and when someone is still trying to still trying to think about and still gets asked to write about uh, the refusal of Winnie. Mandela to apologize, you know, before that forum, I found your, your framings uh, completely productive. So I guess what I just want, I want to say that this, uh, your, your framing of the problematic works for me at a much more intimate level. You, you also, you write about this large level but for me, I found it really helpful also at that very small level of an, an individual inside the institution uh, and these questions of positionality, framing of refusal. 
which is a word that I use as well. That's just a comment while I was waiting for another question to come up. Shingirai Himtero. Go ahead, you have a question. Shingi, Shingirai. The question is written in the chat, I think. Yes, I, she, well, she can raise the question. Well, don't want to raise it. Do you want me to read it out? Okay. <laughs> From Rhodes University uh, in South Africa, uh, Shingi asks, in the context of justice making and reattribution as a mechanism for creating the space for the emergence of different ways of conceptualizing justice, I'm interested in the idea of multiple pan-African pushbacks. We're starting to see a significant pushback from large groups of mainly young African people for justice and accountability for human rights violations against the political elite in their own countries. So the question she asks is, who in your book are the largest architects of the pushback um, and your thoughts on multiple or counter pushbacks? Oh, my, and Shigirai's mic isn't working, thanks. Yeah. Okay. Uh, great. And and then I see Doris has one too, which I'll get get to afterwards. Um, uh, so thank you for for that uh, question. Um, so in the the book, uh, the there are multiple actors who are engaged, and of course one of them are. Uh, members of the African Union, uh, members of various organizations, including the Pan-African Lawyers uh, Organization, um, and then everyday people who we interviewed in Kenya, in Addis, uh, in Nigeria, uh, who are engaged in what I'm conceptualizing as a, well, I'm saying pushback, but it's reattribution. So this is the the, the framing and so reattribution as a form of refusal is in and of itself contradictory. Um, and so on one hand, as I was saying earlier, you may very well have, you know, an African lawyer who is pro um, mm. ICC and on the other hand, in another breath, uh, actually has severe issues with uh, ICC selectivity questions or a range of, of other things uh, that have to do with the same set of issues, but there is indeed uh, ambivalence. So um, I think that one of the things that we can presume is with action there is pushback, that with, with, with power there is tension. Uh, and what interests me is how this is playing out in relation to legal encapsulation, in relation to legality. Uh, and, and how, on one hand, the law is seen as being weaponized. On the other hand, there are these counter processes uh, in which people engage in actions like, uh, I mean, Shireen's point about the afterlife and the TRC in South Africa um, is actually a, a, a great point that I write about in, in the book in relation to the politics of forgiveness. So the ways that uh, emotional regimes around the forgiveness played out, but it too had its refusals. It too, I mean, there's the Winnie Mandela's refusal, but there, there, there are many others. And there's, um, you know, this was part of the popular discourse, the kind of, you know, rolling over your eyes and, um, you know, a recognition of hypocrisy and contradiction, uh, a sense that other people needed to be, go before the, the court and that judicial mechanisms uh, needed to be deployed in, in, in these contexts. So I, I think that in terms of operationalizing reattribution, one of the things that we can think about with multiple generations, with social movements, roads must fall. Um, uh, someone said something about fees. Uh, no, okay, I think that was a different question. Uh, that, that yes, in fact, the, the, the architecture of refusal is, is key here and what exists alongside it and what, what I'm arguing that we need to excavate are the ways that emotional regimes are deployed. 
What is it that people call on to make the point, to make it legitimate, even as there are um, contradictions at play? Uh, and so, yes, multiple pushbacks for sure, contradictory tensions, but really to map out what are the regimes that are used? You know, what are, what's the vocabulary? What is the inner architecture? Uh, what are the technocratic forms of knowledge around which these arguments are, are based? And what are their manifestations? And how do we connect that to a much larger architecture that is at play? And so that's the, the framework that, that, that I um, map out for, for thinking about those formations. Thank you. Doris, do you want to ask your question? I always find it better than just leaving it as text. I find Zoom needs to be humanized, in my view. Well, thanks. I, I, I think I preferred it as a, te as a text because then um, you could read into it uh, what you wanted. But, um, so, but thank you, first of all, for the, the two sets of questions, uh, two sets of comments, rather, which are so rich, and I feel like I'm only still Kind of digesting them and Kamari, um, you know, I'm really looking forward to reading your book because it's just I, it, I kept you know I keep nodding throughout the conversation. So um, I don't know that I have much of a question except except what I put in the comments is that as I was listening, I was thinking about um, kind of the the, the uh, really strong allure of international criminal justice in the case of Rwanda, particularly for people situated in Canada, where it felt like. Um, sort of a vindication of a particular representation of what happened in Rwanda viewed through the lens of Romeo Dallaire. Um, and yet, you know, when I was reading the judgments, and I never, I didn't read all of them in the end, I kind of got to a certain point, and I, I got to the point where the court really struggled to bring home convictions of the presumed senior leadership uh, that were said to have been behind the orchestration of the genocide. Um, and it was a version of the genocide that um, Alison Deforge had uh, written about in her magisterial text, as it's often referred to. And yet the court um, would tie itself up in no, not trying to get this conviction, right? That the facts, the, the way they landed just did not fit um, the picture that Deforge painted in her book. Um, and so I wondered about what what those sorts of experiences mean for the effective pull of international criminal law, where legal technicality kind of grinds away um, at that kind of, in, you know, very admittedly problematic emotional framing that, you know, the proponents of, of the, the tribunals, international criminal tribunals had. That, uh, Kamari, that's the last question. So maybe in answering it, you want to also say any last things you feel you should add. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, and thanks, Doris. Uh, good to see you. Um, yeah, the, the, so the, it, the, the technocratic questions of intent are of interest to me. I mean, I, I don't, in large part, in this particular book, uh, talk a lot about um, the ICCR and some of the challenges around intent. But uh, so the, the, the case studies are about temporality for the most part and continuing crimes and sort of legal time and legal temporality um, in, in many ways. But I'm actually working on a project now that uh, actually thinks through these questions of intent versus um, the, the manifestations of violence and what some of the, the challenges for the law, the technocratic application of, of the law when, when, when actually something like intent to commit genocide or intent to, uh, you know, to be racist uh, aren't, that aren't useful really, that, that, that in, in fact, uh, thinking instead about the ma the manifestation of that violence, the physicality of it, um, the the actor uh, beyond the mens rea, the actual action in in play. Um, so I mean, of course, in the book, though, it's I 
the technical questions that I look at are around legal time and temporality and many of the, the interviews that we did in which um, people were concerned about and because a lot of the interviews were Kenyan that were in relation to legal time were Kenyan based. Uh, of course, the, the question had to do with these histories of violence over time, not just the post 2008-9 or 2007-8 violence. Um, so I, I think that the, we, we look at legal time there in that text then to, to, to make sense of the limitations of the law. And I guess that's the takeaway message that when the when law become, when legality is the answer, and this is what I started with, when we think that legality is the answer for these deeply political formations, uh, that's actually when we fooled ourselves that international law in and of itself can solve these problems, in, including, I mean, it, it also pushes us to think about the extent to which sometimes an indictment, if not handled properly, can aggravate uh, and this was Christiana's uh, point, I think, uh, was it Christiana who, yeah, um, multiple sides of the conflict. So that was the, her, her, her last um, comment or question, uh, the extent to which at times the limits of the law uh, really come, uh, are in full force when we think about the afterlives of an indictment when only one side is indicted. Uh, and so, and, and we certainly see that playing out on an everyday um, level. Thank you so much, Kamari. Thank you, uh, Christiane, as well. And thank you, everybody who attended. This was an excellent attendance. I, I did have a worry this morning that we'd all be too frazzled and tired and have our eyes elsewhere, but it, um, it's a testament to what an important and good book this is. Kamari that people have, have turned out for it. Um, I think perhaps the Duke fall sale is over, but I put it on social media. It was available at 50% off. I sound like a salesperson, but I do urge you to buy the book because it, it, it has multiple gifts, I can tell you, from the point of view of all of our research, but as well as teaching, as well as just generally its interventions in a global conversation. So thank you so much. I hope to see you in person soon. I hope we can all have a seminar in person soon. And um, yeah, thank you all for coming. Thank, thank you, Shireen, and uh, thank you to everyone. And I should say,